Do me a favor and feel this fact. While you were asleep last night, over 50,000 human beings lost their life. That's 50,000 families, communities, and tribes. In eight hours, that's hundreds of thousands of human beings that will have to comprehend a new reality. Four and a half years ago was the first day of my senior year of college right here at Montana State University. On this day, my classmates reminisce about summer, summer internships on their walk to class. Meanwhile, I was desperately driving the opposite direction to St. Patrick's Hospital in Missoula. On this day, my father stopped living and left me with one sole remaining family member, my mother. On this day, I was objectively one of 50,000 mourning the loss of a loved one. But for me, I was just boarding the train to the most confusing, painful, and transformative ride of my life. Let's start at the beginning. Hello, everyone. My name is Robel. My name is the combination of my father's name, Robert, and my mother's name, Bella. My father, Robert, was an Army vet, retired rancher, and a trained fanatic. My mother, on the other hand, is a Filipino immigrant who was a domestic helper in Singapore, is roughly four foot eight with heels, and has more energy than a nuclear power plant. <laughs> my parents met as pen pals. For those who are unfamiliar with that term, that's what happened before we were swiping right on Tinder. At the, time, I, uh, at the time, my dad was recently retired. He was 60 and was just looking to relax. But things quickly changed when my mom expressed an unwavering need to have one child. That's where I fit this picture. As an only child, I was the byproduct of a tremendous amount of time and energy. I swear my mom would pick me up after she got home from work and not put me down until she fell, fell asleep. This was literally our routine until I outgrew her at the age of seven. That was a huge milestone. Uh, as a, growing up, I had the privilege to play a ton of sports. Some I really loved, and some not so much. <laughs> as a young person, my yardstick for meaning was doing well in these sports and filling out the report card. The only problem was with this is that I was too busy thinking about other people. And over time, this anchored me into a trajectory of thinking what other people think. I was so preoccupied with that that I didn't have time to think for myself. So when it came time to choose a college degree, it was an easy choice because it ultimately wasn't mine. I packed my bags and headed to Montana State University to pursue a degree in environmental engineering. It's what Dad wanted, so I did it. Because this degree came from no passion of my own, my studies fell to the background and the social scene kind of sneaked its way to the main priority. The main objective was finding the next sick ski run or the next party. Gosh, it was so much fun. Um, but the thing about that lifestyle is it did not give me the opportunity to step back and readjust the way I was living my life. The wind was blowing me towards a degree I did not love, drifting off of a lack of introspection and the will to impress my father. The only problem with this equation is it's pretty hard to impress somebody who's not there. My dad was 60 years old when I was born. His mortality was no secret. But what remained a secret was my inner purpose, who I wanted to be, and what I believed in. Today, I'd like to share with you three things that I learned in the wake of my father's death. The first is self-discovery. Self-discovery is this absurd part about the human experience that I've always been baffled by. Everything that we've known to be true is shaped by things around us. Parents, coaches, teachers come together. They teach us how to walk, talk, and think. It's such a beautiful thing. Then all of a sudden, without a moment's notice, we're asked the big question. What do you want to do with the rest of your life? Have you guys heard that? Um, yeah, so everything that we've known to be true is shaped by others around us, and now we're asked this? What kind of relationship is this? So... What do you do when you're 21 and you're faced with this question and you just recently lost your father? Well, you cry. <laughs> you cry a lot. And you should probably go see a therapist. But if you're a guy like me that's been to put, told to put on armor and tough it up, it's not happening anytime soon. So I ran. And I ran a lot. Running was much more than an exercise. It was the birthplace of self-discovery. Through movement innate within our species, I escaped from the noise of the outside world, and I finally created hours where I could think about who I was and who I wanted to be. For the first time, there was no parent, teacher, or coach telling me direction. 
for the first time I finally felt in charge. Essentially what I'm saying is learn something new and lean in. It doesn't have to be running. You don't even have to break a sweat. But my rules are it has to be challenging, you have to be alone, and leave the AirPods at home. Meditation, painting, writing, just give yourself space without external influence and I bet you'll find out who you are. It seems so simple, but you'd be surprised how hard it is to exist in this world without being in your own head. So great, you found something to do for a couple hours. Now onto the big question on the block. What do we do with the rest of our day? I'm talking about the occupation, the bread maker. My, my tip on navigating the maze it is such a hard thing to pick our occupation because there's over 12,000 jobs to choose from. 12,000. It's dreadfully hard. That's why myself and many others do the choices that are told to us. This phenomenon is called the paradox of choice. With so many choices, we become less satisfied with our decision. My tip on navigating this is not to focus on what you want to do, but rather focus on what you don't want to do. It's a simple process of elimination. Would you rather make this choice or this choice? Hmm, interesting. Anyways, would you rather make that choice or this choice and have less options? It's simple probability. It's simple probability. So what I did is I gained a range of experiences. After my father died, I tried out wild and firefighting. I realized I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to be a teacher. I didn't want to be a coach. I ultimately realized that I didn't want to be a CNA, which, shout out to any CNAs out there, that is God's work. Life seems to eclipse our light and test us in unimaginable ways. But if your guiding light is somebody else's, get ready for an existential crisis. So now, great, you found out some, something that you want to do. Now on to the hard part, transformation, change. That's the second thing that I want to talk about. Would you rather grow and change in a time of, on your own terms, in a time of joy and inspiration? Or would you rather change, be, be forced to change amidst pain and suffering? As soon as I lost the comfort of the immediate phone call to dad, I quickly lost engineering. I didn't change because I wanted to. I changed because I absolutely had to. We all, we all have the capacity to change, but it's never the first choice. We are creatures of habit that have a predilection towards comfort, convenience, and ease. And never has it been so hard to choose what we, never has it been so hard to exercise control. We, we are not only have to rebel against ourselves, but we have to rebel against the world around us. We're surrounded by so many things around every corner, Two clicks on Amazon. I believe that our responsibility is to exercise control in a world where there will never be enough. I'd like to artic articulate this with a healthcare scenario that's presenting in every hospital across the country. The story goes like this. Every day, 49,000 people die from cardiovascular disease. It's a preventative disease and an insidious one, too. The tale goes like this. Patient presents with a 30-year history of consuming a highly processed meat-based diet that has been engineered to have one fantasizing about the next bite before they even finish the first. And it all gets washed down with an IPA and a couple Oreos. Over time, they convince themselves that it'll all be fine using self-justified mantras like, it'll never be me, or, but I'm different. Then all of a sudden, on a typical Tuesday morning, they start to notice gradually worsening substernal angina radiating to the jaw and arm. It's also known as chest pain. Within a blink of an eye, they present to the ER surrounded by a cacophony of beeps and a plethora of cords. And all of a sudden, a cardiologist walks up to them and assesses them and describes what's known in the medical community as a non-ST elevated myocardial infarction due to atherosclerotic plaque that will need percutaneous coronary intervention. But the patient gets some oversimplified clog pipe analogy where they're led to believe their beating heart as a bunch of PVC in a backed up kitchen sink where not even Drano will make it all go away. Now lying there on the hospital bed, all the feelings come in at once. They get vivid memories of their favorite teacher, their favorite parent, their wife, their kids, their favorite hike, their favorite river. Now with enough pain and an act of desperation, they'll, any, they'll do anything to go back to how it used to be. 
Meanwhile, the seemingly insignificant diet that whispered for three decades is mounted for change that is most often irreversible. I don't mean to pick on food here. It's just one example of how we don't choose to change unless we absolutely have to. It's an example of how we cling on to yesterday's narratives. There's no reason for you to be the person that you've always been. It's so easy to forget that human beings are malleable. We all have the capacity to change. Although I grew away from engineering, one thing that my education taught me is that we do have the ability to approach life from the lens of prevention. Engineering is an amazing field because it mitigates for error and forecasts for future harm. The best engineering designs create buildings that don't collapse, they create planes that don't explode. The amazing gift of our tremendous amount of scientific understanding is that we can leverage knowledge to inform our decisions today and create a better future. We don't need an engineer to solve our problems, we know the answer. Get more sleep, speak up to the boss, have a vulnerable conversation, put the phone down. We've all laid witness to the miraculous process of a human baby that transforms before our eyes. Something that I constantly remind myself and want to remind all of you today is that no matter what age you are, you're still that young baby, that boy or girl held up in your mother's hands, blowing the dandelion, resilient and perfectly capable of change. Today's greatest accomplishments did not come from standing still. They came from uncertainty, risk, and courage. The last thing that I'd like to talk about is showing up for the ones we love. For this, let's revisit the last day of my senior year of college, or the last day of the first day of my senior year of college. On this day, when I showed up, finally showed up to St. Patrick's Hospital, I could hear my mom's harrowing cries echoing through the hospital. I ran, and, I ran to her and embraced her. Now I was holding her up. Together, looking down at the hospital bed, the man who raised me, who cooked me breakfast, who taught me piano. Stiff as a rock and unresponsive. One of the hardest things that I've had to come to terms with is what happened in the moment in that hospital. For three hours after my dad passed away, not a nurse, not a CNA, not a doctor came in to check on us. Not a how are you, not a pat on the back. The pain, in, the pain that I felt in those three hours were unlike anything I've ever experienced in my life. Stranded in that hospital, I felt stranded in my own mind. Everyone knew, everyone knew that day, everyone in the hospital that day knew how to stay, resuscitate a heart. No one, no one knew what to do when it flatlined. Western medicine is so good at prolonging life and stabilizing morbidity. But when it comes to mortality, it's at best an afterthought. So, yeah, we have to show up for the ones that we love. And the last thing that I'd like to share with you guys is that there's five stages of grief. And the fifth stage of grief, defined by Kubler Ross, is acceptance. In order to accept, our capacity to accept is defined on our capacity to understand. In order to grow and learn from those that we understand, to grow and learn from the ones that we love, we must understand them. I forever am thankful for the time that I had with my dad, but I'll, for, but I'll always remember those questions that I never asked. Those were the ones that led to the deepest wounds. You only live once, but some of us decide to be frustrated and angry rather than to be curious and interested in the ones across from us. It's so easy to take that time for granted. It's so easy to get convinced by the worries of time in school that there will be enough time. What I'm telling you from when I lost my father is 
those feelings and those emotions and those beautiful conversations, those are the most important things. There will never be enough time, but we can certainly minimize for the pain, the confusion, and regret. Do me a favor and feel this fact. While you're asleep tonight, over 128,000 babies will be born. In eight hours, it's 128,000 human beings that will be shaped by the world around them and be asked to figure out the world inside of them. The day my father stopped living was the day I decided to start. Our inner purpose is a metamorphosis. It constantly changes and adapts to our circumstance. But right here, right now, I feel closer to who I want to be more than I ever have. Through witnessing death, four and a half years of self-reflection, trial and error, and a lot of running, I found myself to my new challenge, medical school. As an aspiring physician, I am dedicated to empowering my patients and helping them catalyze change. I'm dedicated to approaching chronic, attacking chronic disease through the lens of event prevention. And most importantly, I'm dedicated to showing up and never letting my patients heal alone. If there's one thing I leave you with all today, it's don't forget that you're alive. Don't forget that you're alive and why. Thank you.